This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Are back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And uh, so, Randall, yes, have, sir. Do you have plans for today's show? I know we wanted to talk about some sacred geometry, possibly. Yeah, we were going to talk about the upcoming workshop briefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have time, or it's too expensive, or whatever. Do the live stream because the whole thing's going to be live stream for only seventy-two bucks, and it's going to be like ten hours of instruction. And then the recorded version of the live stream will be uh, available in perpetuity. In other words, you, you buy the live stream, even if you can't listen in on the live stream, you can, of course, get the, um, get the recorded version of it. So yeah, it what this video, is going to do, it's going to... Video on demand. Yeah, video no, on demand. It's available thank afterward. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And so this is going to be kind of serve to be an intro to what's coming later when we get into the more advanced stuff which we are and it's in the it's in the works right now so that's what this is this is kind of like introduction to, to the basics uh, and it ought to be a lot of fun i think it will be and we're putting out a video tomorrow where i'm going to show what the whole uh supply kit when you buy the supply kit now the supply kit is not included in the tuition cost of 72 bucks and it's not mandatory but if you want to participate and have more fun just go ahead and you know there's a, a an amazon uh it's been set up on amazon you, a what what'd you call it bundle bundle an amazon bundle oh. thank you and you can you can buy that bundle and then um if you decide to go on i mean there's you know you're gonna have a big old sketch pad and you're gonna have all these supplies and everything that you need it's not a one-time thing if you decide that you want to learn more and participate in other classes and workshops you'll have everything you need you guys aren't going to be able to sneak up, point. are you? What's that? You guys, you two, the Serpent Brothers? Is it possible the you guys could swing up? Oh, be there. Be there? Man, that would be great, but it's... It's August. It's like right in the middle of harvest. The year's uh, harvesting, yeah. yeah. Okay, well. Yeah, and we did just, we just harvested some stuff, and we're, so we're already in the middle of it. We got some. Uh -huh. Hopefully, it's going to be rosé fermenting right, right now. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got a, we got quite a bit of stuff going on in these next couple of months. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you guys are trying to clear the slate for Gabland trip in Wash in uh, Washington in September, I hope. Yes. That's clear and then and then of course we're going to Egypt in yeah. November. So. Yeah. Yeah. So those those Gabland trips are filling up, so yeah, people uh, I'll put some links in the description here of the previous shows where we've talked about the previous trips and uh we're getting a lot of repeat tourists uh, going back and doing the same thing because they just having so much fun and uh, loving the people and the scenery and uh, you know the experience with Randall and the uh, and the whole group. So uh, make sure you get in there with us for that one. Uh, the two of them actually sell out. Uh, love to see you out in Washington and uh, touring the Scablands in late September. Yeah, and this is really the golden opportunity to learn this script that's uh, that tells the story that's been engraved into the global landscape. And there's no more spectacular place on the planet than Eastern Washington in terms of, of uh, the way this, uh, this evidence is, is displayed to see. And um, yeah, it's a, it's, you guys have been there. Did you know it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's a mind stretching experience once you wrap your head all around these events. And what was interesting, you told me, Russ, is like when you guys drove back from Montana, and yep. you were driving back down through the Snake River area and down through Lake Bonneville. And yes. the whole way you're driving for days, you're still seeing the evidence of these gigantic events. Yeah, it was it's fantastic. Like once you once you are able to see it, you go on one of these trips and you're sort of shown it in person. Then you can begin to recognize similar features mm -hmm. elsewhere or at least similar looking features. And then it makes yeah. you wonder what's causing them, if you're especially if you're way farther south. Right. So you. Yeah. You know, of course, the Bonneville event, we know about that, but still, it was fantastic to leave the 
uh, Missoula Basin, where we had been mm-hmm. seeing strand lines all over mountains, all over the place, driving hundreds of miles through this area, and then go down into another area where there was another enormous lake that catastrophically outflowed and just, you know, mm-hmm. so it's really, really amazing. Yeah. I mean, in as many years as we, the two of us, Brad and I have been going out there. Um, I still struggle sometimes to get my head wrapped around the magnitude of this thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so yeah, enormous. Still yeah. trying, still trying. Yeah. Cause, yeah. cause the more you travel, the more you look around and the more you recognize the features, the bigger you realize it is. And so, yeah, you're right. still trying to expand the, the, the vision, uh, to that global scale. Yeah. But something that really, uh, had an effect on me going, going back to the early days is they, they had one of the, the scientists, Randall quotes and talks about him doing the, uh, the hydrologic calculations, Victor Baker, they pulled him into planetary studies and he went down to Arizona state um, because the, the scablands there were the, the most similar to what they were witnessing on Mars and considering that, well, these look like water flow flood features, you know, who's an expert in that. And Victor Baker has, has worked with that for decades uh, parallel, parallel to the scabland study. So I was always fascinated with that. That is the most on this planet, that is the most place that looks like Mars. Mm. So wow. Come to Mars with us uh, in Washington. Yeah. And since you mentioned Victor Baker, who did the 1973 study that really ramped up the, the magnitude of, of the floods, basically doubled the quantity of the discharge over what Pardee had calculated. Um, and as we talked about, he used a more sophisticated uh, hydrological formula called the step backwater method, uh, as opposed to what Pardee used, which was the Chesi formula in um, in Eddie Narrows, which is we we did a traverse of Eddie Narrows on our trip last month out in Montana, um, and we talked about why that discrepancy was, and that that my belief is that where Baker did his calculations that flow was being augmented by uh, another source um, over and above on top of what Pardee was measuring. But there was a paper that came out after, you know, uh, after the publications of the scab land started, you know, really coming out in the seventies and eighties, you had a group of uh, Russian geologists who were looking at uh, some of the terrain around the uh, Altai mountains uh, at near where China, Siberia, and Mongolia come together and found evidence there for these gigantic floods that were that are on the same scale, very close to the same magnitude as um, the Scablands floods, which is truly remarkable and, and really raises questions about, you know, and of course, it's the usual, the standard explanation is that there was, you know, an ice dam. But Really, um, I think we have to start looking beyond that ice dam to something else. There was a paper that came out in 1999 uh, in the, uh, at the Lunar and Planetary Science uh, Conference, that uh, the 28th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference it was in, in 1999. Preliminary Remote Sensing Assessment of Pleistocene Cataclysmic Floods in Central Asia. And... The conclusion of the two authors, Victor Baker and uh, Komutsu, Kama, Kom, Komutsu and Klute, there's three authors. This is what they concluded. And this I find very interesting to ponder for multiple reasons, right? Recently, well, first of all, I'm going to back up. I'm going to give you another quote. This is from 1999, but I'm going to back up to another quote here. And this quote is from Sir James Hall who wrote this in 1815 in the Transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh on a, in a paper called On the Revolutions of the Earth's Surface. And this is what he says when he's looking at these, uh, this evidence in, in Europe primarily. He says, the facts brought forward in the following paper, according to my view of the subject, clearly indicate the operation of immense torrents. So that was 1815, Sir James Hall. Um, and then um, we have Henry Howarth, who in 1887 was one of the early catastrophists who 
sort of formed that bridge between the first generation of geologists who are almost all catastrophists and which is, you know, pre, let's say, Civil War up to the decades after the Civil War. By the end of the 19th century, pretty much once geology became established as an academic discipline in the universities at that point, um, it became dogmatic. And, you know, with the advent of uniformitarianism and gradualism, that became the kind of the, the, the underlying premise of all geological studies was that the present is the key to the past, that we, we explain all past change in terms of things that we can witness going on right now. So in a sense, what that means is that if it, this precludes the possibility of there being anything, you know, beyond what we've seen, let's say, since science has been keeping track, and that really doesn't go back more than two centuries, really more than like a century and a half. Um, so then uh, Sir Henry Holworth, this is what he said in, in his work called The Mammoth and the Flood, in, written in 1887. I submit with every confidence that I have proved the position that the extinction of the mammoth in the old world was sudden and operated over a wide continental area involving a widespread hecatomb in which man, as well as other creatures, perished. That this destruction was caused by a flood of waters which passed over the land, drowning animals and then burying their remains, and that this catastrophe, catastrophe forms a great break in human continuity, no less than in the biological records of human life, and is the great divide when history really begins. He goes on to say that towards the conclusion of his, of his book, this completes my survey of the evidence furnished by the mammoth itself. And I believe that not only is it consistent with the conclusion that the animal and its companions were finally extinguished by a sudden catastrophe involving a great diluvial movement over all the Northern Hemisphere from the Pyrenees to the Bering Straits, but it is consistent with no other conclusion. The evidence is not only ample, but it is evidence which converges from all sides, and there is literally nothing on the other hand, save a fantastic attachment to a theory of uniformity, which revolts against anything in the shape of a catastrophe. Okay, so now we go from 1815 to 1887. Now we'll come to 1999, the two, two of the most the prominent paleohydrologists in the world, three of the most prominent, right? Preliminary remote sensing assessment of Pleistocene cataclysmic floods. And here's what they say. Recently identified Pleistocene flood features in the Eurasian continent indicate that planetary scale movement of water has been a major agent in shaping the landscape of our planet. Now, that brings us to another point, a very, very important point here that I think people need to grasp. As Howarth says, not only did these events, which we now know and we've talked about repeatedly, the end of the last ice age, the Younger Dryas, et cetera, et cetera, not only did they exterminate 50% of the great megafauna of the planet, they rendered many of the other species close to extinction, including including the human race. And the evidence is now emerging, and we'll see more evidence in the next few years, that there was a population bottleneck at the Younger Dryas. And the beginning of the Holocene was marked by a recovery of the human population. And I can tell you this, almost every piece of evidence that we're now getting in hand suggests that the human population dropped well, well below 500 million. Okay, so, which brings us back to this other discussion, and I think I, we need a little appendage to, a little append amendment to that last discussion that we had. The idea there, and, and, you know, again, there's a lot of people projecting a lot of shit onto what this is that have no knowledge or understanding of the context in which, let's say, the Georgia Guidestones um, were conceived. That context was apocalyptic. Now, 
you go back and in, in, in the, the, the author of that has, uh, of, you know, the, the identity of RC Christian, he wrote a manifesto. His identity was revealed in the 19 by the night, late 1980s. He believed that we were due for an apocalyptic event that was going to reduce the global population. 1980, if you recall, there were, there was a, a, a rise in catastrophism in the 70s and the 80s. It was fueled initially by, uh, by, by Velikovsky's work, but a number of others. But ha Charles Hapgood picked up the, 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 the thread of uh, a catastrophism. And he wrote extensively two books. He wrote extensively uh, about the evidence that existed in, from the 50s to the 70s and previous that pointed to global catastrophes that would have had profound consequences for the human species as well as megafaunal species all over the planet. So in his book, Path of the Pole, he, which I used as a guidebook, basically when I really started researching catastrophism in the late 70s and early 80s, I was using Hapgood's work. Now Hapgood, like Velikovsky, saw the evidence, the empirical data and the hard evidence of the field the evidence from paleontological records, the geological record, the archaeological record for catastrophes, not only in affecting Earth history, but affecting human history as well. So like Velikovsky, he tried to come up with how do you explain this evidence, this, this widespread in-your-face evidence? Well, one of the things that he came up with, and this is based primarily on the fact that if you, if, if you, that, that if you were to actually uh, take the Laurentide and Cordier and combined ice sheets, which were more or less geographically centered on Hudson Bay, and you were to draw a circle around them, that circle would pretty much be 66, encompass uh, six, this, the great circle of uh, the, the uh, longitudinal line, the latitudinal line of 66.6 .6 degrees north latitude, which is the Arctic Circle, right? Now, if you were to shift the whole crust of the Earth, which is what Hapgood's idea was, if you were to shift the crust of the Earth, so Hudson Bay was juxtaposed over to North Pole, well, now the ice sheet pretty much would have filled the Arctic Circle. And what's interesting there is the fact that the bulk of the ice was weighted over to the Western Hemisphere and, and very less in the Eastern Hemisphere. In other words, large swaths of, of Beringia and Siberia were not glaciated. And in fact, there was a, a, a very dense megafauna that inhabited Beringia in Siberia, right? So his idea was that there was a form of accelerated plate tectonics. Now, of course, when he first proposed these ideas, plate tectonics, or at least continental drift, wasn't even accepted paradigm within geological thinking yet. So in some ways, he was kind of ahead of his time. But when... Uh, Continental drift was finally accepted. It was a much slower process than, than Hapgood was envisioning. But so Hapgood was envisioning a type of pole shift very much like Velikovsky and a number of others of that time. Velikovsky was imagining the whole mass of the planet, whereas Hapgood's theory was essentially just the plates moving. Yeah, a crustal shift is what a he A crustal shift, that's exactly right. Yeah. So yeah. when R.C. Christian, conceived of this thing. He was thinking in post-apocalyptic terms. His message was not the message for our time now. It was the message for the future. It was the message for the survivors of the apocalypse that he was uh, imagining might happen in the near future. And so in order to, uh, I, I actually wrote something here about this. Um, and this is what I said. Uh, let's see. Uh, it was not a clandestine instruction to some secretive cabal with a genocidal depopulation agenda. Should I repeat that? It was not a clandestine instruction to some secretive cabal with a genocidal population depopulation agenda. That is internet nonsense gone off the rails. The only addendum I would add to what a previous commenter said is that R.C. Christian was also likely considering a natural catastrophe as well as a nuclear war. And, and the fears in the late 70s and early 80s very much centered around the idea of nuclear war. We saw 
the last two years of the 70s, we saw a major revival of the Cold War and a ramping up of Cold War tensions and, and an, an acceleration of the nuclear arms race. So that was also fueling fueling fears of, of an impending apocalypse. OK, so you have to go into the mindset of the time to understand this. Right. So I go but on. Still, and I I said, mean, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go, no, go ahead, Kyle. Go ahead. Well, I mean, that may be the case, but still. To me, the idea of maintaining a population under 500 million is not a good idea. No, so, no I mean, it's, it's like it's still the advice is like, eh. well, like okay. like your friend Annie Exty said, it's it's not a commandment. It's an idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and R.C. Christian was a conservationist. And the only way that that would be uh, enacted in a good way is if each individual chose to do it how they wanted to. Yeah. It seems like, like, if, you, like if it's a government he, he, imposing it, that's really right. bad. Yeah. So it's like, you know, well, look, it at, doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm just also saying, look at like, the, look at the, that one particular, it's recalled a guideline, a guideline, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Not a yeah. rule. It's a guideline. Okay. Look at that in the context in the rest of the, of them. Now you see, and you don't, here's the thing. You don't have to agree with everything. He right, says. Of course not. Right. Yeah. Here's the here, here's the problem I have with it. It's like the whole cancer culture thing. Cancel culture. Run amok. Destroy everything that you find offensive that right, you don't, that you agree, don't agree, with. agree with. That's what I'm opposed to. Now, it, you don't totally have to agree with everything agree. about what, what it says here. Let me you know, the, what what uh, Annie Exty said was great. He said the Georgia Guidestones were destroyed, but they represented much more than just a few lines of vague text. The Georgia Guidestones were a calendar, a clock, and a compass. Yeah, that's and why granted, I think they're cool. Paying yeah. homage to the ancient tradition of megalithic builders with respect to universal eternal principles, and they served as a tool for humanity. Further, an entire philosophy was destroyed that may be ascertained and best understood by reading the originator's 134-page manifesto in full, even though one may not agree with every part of his discourse. Right. Unfortunately, wild speculation and superstition prevent those with limited understanding from even seeking out the originator's intent. And as a result, intolerance destroyed a monument at the hands of limited understanding. You do not have to agree with ideas expressed by the originator, but chasing pure speculation and the wild conspiracy theories rooted in the limited understanding of others will likely result in bringing you down a path that comes up as empty as the space thought to contain the time capsule. The precepts on the monument were not commandments, but ideas. And it is not hard to understand why these are controversial for many. No, nonetheless, destruction to such a monument is a heinous crime on par with destruction to all other monuments of our ancient past. And should I say statues today? Because right here in downtown Decatur, for years, for decades, there, there stood right in the town square a bronze statue of Thomas Jefferson signing with a quill pen in hand and a scroll in the other as if he's writing the Declaration of Independence. That got moved out of the square. And if it didn't get moved, it was getting it was getting threatened. It had been donated by a private individual. They relocated it because if they didn't, it was going to get destroyed. Yeah. So the, the answer is not wanton, mindless destruction. OK, you don't have to you don't have to agree with everything that's up there. But, you know, you had a, you had a, a sight line on the on the pole star. So if you had a pole shift, well, here, here's what I go on to say. Um, well, I want one other quote from from an old friend of mine, Brian James Fountain, who um, studied deeply into Rosicrucianism, theosophy, and so on. He posted and he said, he said this, you assume that it's meant for us now, but it was meant for a post-apocalyptic world, a fear that was widespread in 1980. And in the midst of the Cold War, this was a time where the fear of what Russia would do was in the air. No killing necessary as this would be rules meant for after a cataclysmic event. There is no racism as he called for a diversity and recognized all nations and their languages or no eugenics or need to killing as eugenics also does not call for diversity and reproduction. And the population of 500 million was based on numbers to maintain a beginning society as it was when it had to start over. So then I go on to say, um, that a sight line to the North Star Polaris could conceivably allow one 
to calculate the amount of axial or crustal displacement in the aftermath of a pole shift. And yeah, I'm or, not saying I endorse. Procession. What? Or processional change. Procession change. Yes, yeah, yes. And I'm not saying I, this is not to say that I'm endorsing the idea of pole shift. I'm just saying that this was likely in the mind of the originator. Um, a site, uh, and then the fact that solstice and equinoctial lines, um, as well as lunar cycles, were incorporated into the design would facilitate reorientation to the cosmos in a world needing a geodetic and calendrical reset. Right. The fact of eight languages conveying the same message could serve as a sort of Rosetta Stone for future linguists to recover languages that might otherwise have become lost. I think it was also intended to be provocative and to inspire discussion. But in the America of 2022, open dialogue of controversial ideas is no longer acceptable. The destruction of the Georgia Guidestones was a wanton act of vandalism. That's, that's my, just like, because you don't agree that some Southern general or Robert E. Lee, you know, and, and here's the thing that really bothers me, right? Who the hell are you? Are you perfect? You who want to destroy our history, whether you agree with it or not, whether it's good or bad, you want to destroy history because somebody did something you don't approve of? Well, let me ask you this. Who are you? Are you the paragon of perfection that can go around and impose your particular moral strictures on the rest of us? No, I, I think there's a great deal of hypocrisy here. And I stick by my, I stick by my words. And if somebody would actually bother to think this thing through, as it's suggested on the monument itself, you know, to that this is a monument to an age of reason where we can reason together, we can debate, we can discuss these things, not destroy. But that's for a lot of people out there who cannot build, who cannot create. What do they do instead? They destroy what others create. That project brought together the, 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 some of the finest stone carvers in the world. It brought together engravers linguists, astronomers, engineers, right? It brought all of these together to create that. Now, because there's one line on there somebody doesn't agree with and they misinterpret, thinking that it's a commandment and not an idea, they go out there and they destroy it. You, you do see the blurriness, though, with what's going on in the world. I mean, there are people in control positions that do want to Reduce That's, the population. Let me they, comment. They, there let are me things comment, are comment. going on that you know, sure. and and so and people want to strike out at something. You know, they don't. They feel powerless. They want to do something. So yeah. I don't agree that that's the way to strike out, but that's the way somebody, whoever it was, felt. Well, I can fight back against those bastards that are you know trying to control the world and turn us into transhumans and et cetera, et cetera, that is going on parallel right now. So, yeah. but that's not I'm, happening. I'm not see, giving any justification, but it's like, I mean, you got to see there is blurriness with all the other stuff that's going on right now. It's not just, well, I don't think it's know. quite as blurry as you think, because here's, here's the thing. There are re if you, any student of history has to recognize there are real conspiracies. There are real conspiracies. Those who are in power conspire. Those who covet power. They conspire. All of history is filled with conspiracies. Now, there are conspiracies today, and there are eugenicists who think we need to depopulate the earth. Absolutely. There is all of this shit going on. There, there's no doubt about that. But you also have to keep in mind what a PSYOP is. A PSYOP is something that's put out there. The extreme example to me is like flat earth and some of the other stuff, because the purpose of that is deliberate. You throw in this stuff to Big get everybody landing. distracted from the real conspiracies, the real thing that's going on. And that's what this was. You know, that was just a big red herring, a gigantic red herring. Let's put this out there and everybody's going, oh, yeah, now I'm going to think I'm going to strike a blow against the new world order. No, you haven't done a damn thing like that. And, and first of all, if you want to, if, if you're, um, you know, if you're uh, in opposition to the new world order, the first thing you need to do is get educated. You can't just be, you know, ruled by your emotions. Oh. Yeah, my, my thing is like, these are the guide stones, people. <laughs> yeah. That the new world order is putting out. That's right. It's not some stones. That's not some bricks out in, a farmer's in, a field. Yield, in a field. But yeah, that's right. I, I disagree with the stuff that that's written on there. I think, you know, to me, it kind of just, some of it just sounds like new agey stuff. 
you know, I think it's a really bad idea to keep a population under 500 million because if you want to be productive and you want to build an amazing civilization and, and reach, you know, space and you need a lot more people. You need a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. But, I've you said, know, yeah. Diversity yeah. of ideas and all that kind of stuff is great. But still, to me, the thing that was cool about the monument it is, is that it was built in the ancient tradition of megalithic architecture mm -hmm. that had astronomical alignments. And yep. it would have been, had it not been destroyed, a future ancient artifact that people could have looked at. And maybe the text would have been gone like so many granite stones that are out there in the elements have degraded but the alignments would have been there and people would have wondered if we had lost, you know, um, our technological advancements in between in the interim between now and then they would have looked at that and said, how did they do? This? How did they build this? Yeah. And how did they yeah. know these alignments and whatnot, whatever was in it? Right. I think we should build stuff like that. Yeah. I would I love agree. to build stuff like that. And, sure. and you know, so and it's look, sad to me that it was destroyed, but you know, it is. It's sad to me that it was destroyed. You know, attack the ideas, demolish the ideas with with counter ideas, with knowledge, with learning. Don't go out there and just blow something up. What does that prove? Yeah, you know, uh, and, it, and I would you're I good with explosives. I would even say that you know, because you were saying that they're not. You were reading what you wrote, and you were saying that they, it's they're not. They weren't made by some secret cabal. And I would say that isn't even to say that there isn't out there somewhere a secret cabal that is in support Absolutely. of depopulation. Yes. What we're saying is those guidestones were not built by those people. That's, right. It, it seems to me like the, these things have been conflated, and now the guides and then the guidestones became connected to those people because it looked like to some people yep. that they were saying the same thing, and it's not very it's not superficially. Really, yes. Yeah. But and there's been depopulation people that have been desired that and wanted that ever since I first began paying attention to politics. Yep. I mean, this is not new. Yeah, the, yeah. Pop, the population it, it, bomb has been, you know, that's yeah. an idea. It was around been, Paul Ehrlich. I, mean, I read it's that a, book in the early 70s. It's and a big it part of environmentalism. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And it, let me just clarify for the record, because apparently some dumbass has commented and said that I'm a, what did they call me? That I'm in oh, favor of depopulation. Yeah, that you support depopulation. Yeah. Actually, what I support is a population of, I think, 10 billion is going to be the ideal number. For this planet, I don't think it'll go over ten billion because we're How seeing dare you. <laughs> the population is beginning. The, the 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 reproduction rates are declining precipitously. Yeah, they drop. Yeah, yeah. they're dropping. Yeah. And I think what's going to happen is it's going to be Monsanto. a in, inverse exponential <laughs> curve. We're going to see population slowly stabilizing around ten billion, and I'm cool with that. So let me let me just put for the record. I don't favor depopulation. In fact, that's one reason why I'm opposing the war in Ukraine is because it could lead to World War III, and World War III could lead to a nuclear war, and nuclear war could lead to depopulation. Absolutely, it could. And I am 100% against that. Okay? So the But you and your secret conspirators in your club mm -hmm. are planning something. <laughs> yeah. Using and, sacred uh, geometry you know, and the, the, handshakes. The most ridiculous conspiracy theory out theorist now theory that's out there is trying to link freemasonry with the new world order and for those that think that there's some kind of a connection i would challenge you to show me one name in the in the the well established we know the elites we know who they are in the Biden administration, in the World Health Organization, in the National Institutes of Health, in the World Economic Forum. We could go right down the list. Where are the Freemasons? They ain't there, bro. They ain't there. No, the Freemasons have had their, um, their uh, work cut out for them, which is preserving an ancient knowledge. And that's what they're mainly about. And it's another fact, kind of PSYOP. It's another PSYOP. Right. You hold up these characters, these red herrings out there. Oh, it's the Freemasons. It's the Freemasons. No, it ain't the Freemasons. In fact, let me point this out, and I might have made this, this, this comparison before. You know there have been 14 Masonic presidents, right? And, of course, that's not unusual because once upon a time, Freemasonry, before the advent of the Internet, before the advent of television, before the advent of radio even, Freemasonry was a was a way of 
participating in a, a, a social gathering of like-minded individuals who were, um, you know, who hard work, good work ethic, um, who were essentially creative, who had charitable impulses, who were also interested in, in knowledge, particularly ancient knowledge, who could come together in the spirit of fellowship and brotherhood. Now, do you guys have asked you this before? And I think you might remember who was the last Masonic president. Yeah, I don't remember. Ford? Yep. What is going on here? Yeah, this like is like Mike a has seismic all the shift. <laughs> here, um, gee, what's going he's, on? He's the secret handler, folks. He's running this show. <laughs> Mike is the real NWO guy over here. He's yeah, running the world. He <laughs> look at Look at where he's sitting. He's, on he's in his office. office. He's in his office, he's, right? Uh, yeah, in front of the in entire his, planet. He's, in, he's in, actually in orbit as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Now I lost you know, my to, to train your point of thought. about Masonic presidents, I think there was a famous painting of George Washington wearing a Masonic apron and dedicating a cornerstone of the Capitol or some other building in Washington. The Capitol. Yeah. The nation's capital. Yeah, that's right. Well, so you, I were think, getting, you were getting to how many uh, presidents were Episcopalian, I think is probably where you were going. <laughs> that's exactly where I was going. Um, yeah, because 14 presidents have been, have been, um, Freemasons, but 23 presidents have been Episcopalians. Ah, so they're really so, running the world. Is that so what you're yeah. there you go. That's what I'm trying to say. Really it's not the, the Freemasons, it's the Episcopalians. <laughs> they're the secret cabal running the world. And no, and, and that's true. There are 23 presidents that were Episcopalians. So what, what's the deal? What's going on there? Well, obviously something. It's obviously a conspiracy. Well, I, I think that, you know, my generation, generations after me, are are we've been like we've been brought up and raised in. I guess like the the education system is kind of like it teaches you here's all these problems and here's the the other people who if if they don't agree with how to fix the problem, then they're the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it creates this idea of the other, and whoever that other is they're responsible for causing the problem if they disagree with how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, I feel like this is where all of the discourse has gone. And when people, um, you know, the, when it comes to climate change, for example, they'll say, Oh, you know, we got to do, here's what we have to do, you know, carbon emissions, this and that. If you disagree with that, then you're causing it, right? Mm -hmm. You're responsible for the destruction of the planet. So it creates enemies out of people that disagree with you. Yes. And, and so was, everyone and then yep. everyone's online and has instantaneous access to everybody's opinions because they're just putting it all out there all the time. Like like us. We're uh, we're up here recording it. And uh yeah, if you disagree then you're an enemy. And I don't I I disagree with that idea. Like there's more than one way to solve a problem. To skin have, a cat. Well, I didn't want to say that because nowadays guys, you'll like be getting guys. accusations like will be flying. Yeah, <laughs> we now have a friend with a skinned cat, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And we should we should be able to have these discussions without flipping out and thinking that just because somebody disagrees with you that they're an enemy. Yeah, we're all in this together. So look, it, there seems to be this tendency to want to reduce everything to black and white and then align yourself with one side or the other. And it's really, you know, since I came of age, I thought the big problem was the right wing, you know, back in the days of, of Richard Nixon and, you know, the hard hats beating the shit out of anybody who opposed the war and all of that, but it's completely flipped. Now it's the left that is primary. And, and of course it's again, a lot of shades of gray in there, but the, the, the attempts to suppress, you know, a diversity of ideas is now coming primarily from the left. It's not coming primarily from the right, although there is some from the right. But right now, I mean, it's not the right wing that's tearing down statues. Um, that's the, the left is tearing down statues. And, you know, go tear down a statue of Robert E. Lee, right? Well, uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you look at the Civil War and you study the Civil War, what you realize is that, yeah, it was not a black and white issue, and it was not purely about slavery. And there are contexts, and I know I'll 
there'll be somebody who misinterprets what I am about to say. And, and this is something we can, we can dive into in a future podcast if we really want to get controversial. But, you know, when you start talking about slavery in, a, in the new world, slavery, particularly in America, it always begins with the transatlantic slave trade. It always begins there. And people kind of have this picture in their minds that um, what, you know, the Dutch and the, and the Portuguese who were like the first and then eventually the, the Brits followed, um, they didn't go into the interior of Africa and round up people and, and enslave them. When they arrived in West Africa, there was a thriving slave market already in existence. And should we not talk about that? Is that, is that, if you talk about that, that does that immediately get you branded as racist? I don't think so because the whole world had slavery for thousands of years. It was the norm. And when you look at how some of the very first places that really made the concerted effort to end slavery, you know, America was one of them. England eventually, you know, be, they too changed, changed their opinion on it. And, and you had some very heroic individuals in Great Britain who, you know, really put their, uh, their careers and reputations on the line to end slavery. But, you know, we fought a whole civil war, you know, quarter million soldiers from the union side were killed, what, presumably to end slavery in this country. Of course, what people don't talk about is the fact that, again, amongst the many things that aren't being talked about, after the victorious union army defeated the, 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 the Confederacy, they regrouped and they needed to have a mission for the army so they didn't have to completely disband it. And then guess what happened? Well, they recruited um, uh, Sherman and uh, what's his name? The other despicable character um, that came up with the phrase, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. He was the one who came up with the plan uh, to uh, Sheridan? Sheridan. Sheridan. Thank you. It was Sheridan who came up with the plan to infect blankets with, with smallpox. Oh yeah. So Sherman and Sheridan were now placed in, in, in the head of the U S government's Indian campaign, which was primarily being done at the behest of big railroad interests. So they went out there and they basically came up with the plan of how do we defeat the Plains Indians? So the railroads can, can go through. Um, and, and of course what they did was unlike, Oh, say like James J Hill, who built the great Northern railroad, who sent his scouts out years in advance to negotiate acceptable terms with the tribes that were in the way, the, the, the Southern railways like the Union Pacific and the Central uh, Railroad, what they did was they set out, I think it was five miles of right of way on either side. So then when the, um, the, the cronies of the politicians um, knew that this railroad was gonna go through, they started buying up the land because they knew as soon as the railroad went through that this land on either side, maybe it was 10 miles. It was some ridiculous amount of right of way that was way, way, way beyond what the railroads would actually need for maintenance. Right? So what they did was then it was, it was cronyism at the worst. So you had the friends of the politicians buying up all of this land adjacent to where the railroads were going. And then the U S army went out and decimated the tribes. And one of their big strategies to affect that, was to, and this was Sheridan's great idea. Sheridan said, well, the basis of the Plains Indian economy is the Buffalo. If we wipe out the Buffalo, we'll wipe out their economy. So they put a $10 uh, per head bounty on the Buffalo and the soldiers went out also and began uh, exterminating as many Buffalo as they could. And all of this was a consequence of the Union vic victory in the Civil War. And nobody really wants to talk about that. The redeployment of the Union Army to the Western frontier to suppress the Plains Indians. So there's always, when, you, when you're talking about history, it is not black and white. There's always shades of gray in there. But there are these factions today that want to simplify, strip everything down, strip everything down to this black and white, and mainly because it saves them from actually having to think through the intricacies of, of an event or a policy and looking at the, the various nuances and shades of gray that are the real history of everything. It is not black and white. So, you know, my, my, whole, my whole point is, is it's like, see, 
okay, when I'm a kid and I'm coming up, you wanted to do, you wanted to have an opinion on something. What did you do? Well, you had to actually go and research. There was no place where you could just start spouting off some half-baked ideas because you watched some internet video. You had to go to the library. You had to look stuff up. And what were the venues for putting your opinions out there? They existed. They were like letters to the editors of magazines and newspapers and things. You could go on. There was talk radio back in the 60s and 70s. You could go on there. But, you know, if you, if you wrote a letter to an editor, and it was filled with a with a bunch of crock. It was filled with a bunch of half baked bullshit. And they threw it out. And you know when I, you know when I started reading newspapers as a teenager, you would get oftentimes you would have newspapers, major newspapers, and they would have like two sides, which was limited. But at least you would have like here's the conservative side, here's the liberal side, and they would they would have conservative commentators, they would have liberal commentators. And you could read through and you could make up your own mind who, who made the most sense, right? Well, now, and, and here's the point. If you wanted to write a letter to the editor and it was just with a bunch of half-baked stuff, you know, they, they threw it out. They would look at their, and they would vet the letters and go, okay, this, this guy has something to say. This guy is bringing some real knowledge to the matter and you would get your letter published. Or, I had some letters. Published. Or they'd just throw it out if they disagreed with it. <laughs> yeah. Or well, yes and no. But see, that's the thing. When you had a when you had a newspaper, like in Atlanta, you had two newspapers. Come on, you wait the, a second now. You're telling me that newspapers back in the day showed both sides. Come on. Well, you you had in Atlanta, you I had two. So. Hey, listen, uh, in as Atlanta, an, as you a had newspaper guy. I have to say, Kyle, yes, they did. They yes, strove they did. to show balance. Uh, yeah, if, did, you yeah. had, if you had a one newspaper town, but most most uh, cities, and and I say this because I started with my newspaper career in this era. Most cities have still had two newspapers: a morning yeah. and an afternoon. One was generally the conservative. One was generally the, the other was was liberal, um, and they would they would tailor their letters to suit their, the, uh, the opinions of their particular audience. The only but two when they sides. began merging into single newspapers uh, over the 70s and 80s, um, they strove to maintain the balance very deliberately. Mm -hmm. They did. Okay. Yeah. To me, it's <laughs> just like the editor has his idea, and so he picks the craziest letters from one side and the most reasonable sounding letters from the other side, and that's how he makes people see what he wants them to see. Well, I mean, that's, that's certainly the case now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe. I'm I mean, all you have to do it. is look at, listen to MSNBC, NPR, you know, for, for that, you know, and then you listen to Fox News. Now, Fox News, it's bizarre, you know. Fox News actually gives us somewhat of a libertarian slant that I'm not seeing anywhere else. Um, they have a lot that I disagree with, like a lot of the pro-war, the mindless pro-war and jingoism. Don't agree with it. Um, but I'm I'm looking in vain. I, I've been listening to NPR pretty much when I'm doing something that doesn't require me thinking. I'll listen to various radios. I've been listening to NPR for the last month or two to the extent that I, yeah, until I start feeling nausea, I'm going to have to turn <laughs> it off. But, but uh, I mean, like particularly on the climate change thing, which we're going to talk about. We are absolutely going to talk about the climate change thing because that to me encapsulates a lot of other stuff about how propaganda works. But I've listened, and, and that's primarily why I listen to them is because I'm going to hear what they're saying about climate change. They have a regular, like, couple of times a week where they have the, the climate question, they call it. Not once in like six months have I heard any alternative points of view other than that we're in the midst of a climate crisis. And there's and, and there's plenty of challenging views out there, alternative views, and I never hear them on NPR. Now I don't listen to MSNBC, but I'm sure it's the same thing. The Guardian, the same thing. Rolling Stone now has turned into a complete left wing uh, mag, and they they completely promote this left wing agenda and the climate crisis, right? So, I mean, once upon a time, Rolling Stone was sort of a revolutionary, you know, strike a blow for the First Amendment and, you know, against the state and all that. I don't know what's happened to them, but they're just now completely kissing ass to the to the state. But anyhow. Well, when the newspapers first started, they were typically named after the party. Yeah, so it was like, true. in other words, it, it was very clear. It's like. 
here's the Republicans or here's the Whigs or whatever, whoever it was. The newspaper just said, you know, the whatever yeah, the Denver, Democrat, the Denver Democrat or you know whatever. And so it was yeah. clear. It's like, OK, I'm going to read their position and then I'll go read this other people's position. But but then they went through a period where they said, oh, we're going to show both sides. And it's like to me, th- there was never any real difference. I didn't live back then, though. But I'm just in my research. I was well, like, yeah, well, they I did. just, <laughs> yeah, but right. So you think that they show both sides? Okay, they, they did, um, and it's they just, they still try to. But you got to remember, newspapers are a, a dwindling business, a dying business. Yeah, I'm but, just and, saying. And, I don't think a right. whole lot has changed. Historically, in the early days, there there were party papers. There were uh, what we would have considered right wing papers at the time, and left wing papers. Uh, and by the way, speaking of uh, divided politics, anybody who thinks we live in a time of divided politics doesn't know their American history. But that's, if you look at yes. politics before the Civil War, it was that's vicious. I'm yep, I'm with you. And you that's know? why I'm saying I don't think a whole lot has changed. That's um, kind of my point. It's just worse. Everybody's still. But, but in, in terms of newspapers, stuff. after the Civil War, a lot of those political party organs died out and newspapers realized that they needed to begin to appeal to broader audiences beyond their original uh, political constituency. So they began to broaden their, their horizons and, and, and try to appeal to that larger audience. They, um, they made that deliberate effort to be what's considered to be objective, which is a, a, a difficult goal to achieve, but it was their goal to try and present the news objectively instead of through a political lens. They reserved opinions for the opinion page, the editorial page. Mm-hmm. And there's where they, they divided the columns into left and right. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You the recall. opinion pages. Well, yeah. There I were know, opinion pages. I know we're so going to, the- we're going to dive more into the climate stuff that you were talking about last time we were recording Randall, but do you want to, you want to do that after the break? Cause I think we're up at a break. Yeah. Let's do that after point. the break. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll be right back. All right. All right, we well, ready to kick it off? Absolutely ready to kick it off. I thought we were already back. We are. We're already back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia. Second half of the show, and we're actually going to get into the main topic. Um, yeah. Well, wait. Why did you look at me like that, Brad? Brad cut out all the good stuff out of okay. the first segment, folks. <laughs> yeah, this this is the first segment. What are you talking about? <laughs> It's all going to be good now. All right, Randall. Where are we going? Oh, me? Well, yeah, I'd just say, uh, our fearless you know, leader. if you're going to get back to Victor Baker, I, I brought him up, I guess, and then you started down a Victor Baker line. So I just wanted you to go back and read that quote because that that is something that I've repeated in my head so many times as I'm looking at, at Google Earth and looking at topo maps. You know, that statement about the planetary scale movement of water. Yeah, as, as you know, really got my gears going for a long time. Once I heard that. Oh yeah. Well, I think it's. Uh, hey, you've talked me into it. I think that that's definitely worth repeating. Um. So I will. Nineteen ninety nine. Victor Baker, Komutsu, and Klut. Okay, I don't have their first names in front of me, but those were the three authors. It appeared they they said this at the Lunar and Planetary, the twenty. Eighth Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. Re- quote, recently identified Pleistocene flood features in the Eurasian continent indicate that planetary scale movement of water has been a major agent in shaping the landscape of our planet. That's big. It's big. Yeah. Since we said that, I'll just compliment it one more time. And because, of course, we're, I mean, you, you're not talking about planetary scale movement of water independent of what's going on in the climate at the same time. Right? So that's Goro Komatsu, Sharon K. Klute, and Victor R. Baker. Is that what you're Yes. That, okay. There yes. You go. Yeah. Preliminary remote sensing assessment of the Pleistocene. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's cool. it. 
You found it. I found a PDF of it. Yes. So I've got the author's names. Cool. Awesome. Excellent. Well done there, Russ. And uh, Alfred Tyler in 1875. And when I'm reading this, it's thinking, I'm thinking, Russ, maybe we ought to even do a Randall response because um, somebody posted a video, I think, in response to some of Johanna James' recent, maybe, uh, things she talked about or did on the, the Sphinx. Mm-hmm relative to Egypt, and this smirking, smarmy, pretentious, condescending blowhard came on with his video that was supposed to be a a rebuttal of what she did. And uh, And you want to respond to that? Yeah, it would. Yeah, I'm tempted. I really am tempted. tempted. Yeah. I mean, he starts right out the barrel showing he has no clue as to the difference between fluvial and erosion. I mean, and Aeolian erosion of limestones. So he starts right out of the barrel showing that he doesn't really comprehend that. He's pointing to this and he says, this is wind erosion. And uh, Mm. I'm sorry. No, it's not wind erosion. Now, whether or not that ever means that there was a civilization or any of that, all of the, 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 the accoutrements that go with the basic idea, that's another question, but it really boils down to whether, you know, there was a flood that eroded, the walls of the Sphinx ditch. Yeah. What it boils down to. And if there was, and I think it's about as certain as anything could be that the walls of the Sphinx enclosure were eroded by water at some point. Now one could, I mean, it follows from that inevitably that the, that the enclosure was there when the water flowed. So, right. Now, what, what else can you infer from that? Well, that's a whole other question. What else was going on around there? But I think you could conclude unequivocally that the Sphinx ditch was there and it they got flooded by some pretty erosive waters. And so that comes to my mind when I, when I see this next quote that I thought I'd pull up here from, from Albert, Alfred Tyler, who said this uh, in 1875. And I always find it going back to some of these older guys, you know, from a century or two ago and what they were seeing uh, unencumbered, unencumbered, unencumbered by any dogmas or preconceptions or prevailing models of what was possible or not possible. They just looked directly at the landscape and the landscape talked to them, right? All of these guys there. And, and, and I think that's why so many of them, like from Cuvier to Buckland to, uh, Murchison to Sedgwick to Alfred Tyler, who I'm about to quote, were all catastrophists. So he's talking here. This is on a, this appeared in geological magazine back in 1875. And he's uh, been studying Egypt and the Nile Valley. And he says that he's talking about rain that, um, these, that cut these great stream channels that are, He's, he's referring to what we now call an underfit river. In other words, the river or the stream is out of scale, too small to the channel it's flowing in, right? That's the underfit river. So that's what he's talking about here, although he's not calling it an underfit river. These ancient streams were fed all over the globe by such rains as fall only in few places at the present time. In the Nile Valley, there are no tributaries at present falling into it for a thousand miles from the delta. But there are dry valleys opening into the great Nile Valley of enormous size, so that 300 inches of rain falling in the now dry climate of Egypt would be carried away by the river without much difficulty. And you see, we could go on. I mean, there's enormous amount of evidence that is he talking Egypt, about the Ni- the channels that the Nile's actually in, or the tributary channels, channels that channels that are leading into the Nile that are huge compared yeah. to the and most of them are dry. There's nothing flowing in. Oh, I remember I see. seeing, okay. yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. I remember just marveling at the at the actual channel of the Nile itself. It's like yeah, if you're Nile, on but- one side, you can't even see. The wall of the other side. Now that may be due to just dust in the atmosphere sometimes because it was hazy, but it was 
I mean, these cliffs on either side were just huge and they're so far apart. Yeah. It was, yeah. A, it's a massive channel. Are those well, the, it, it, the wadis? The wadis. They are. Yeah. And so, uh, speaking of Victor Baker, um, in his work that he edited, I believe he was an editor, background to paleo, paleo hydrology that came out in 1983. Uh, a chapter entitled Large Scale Fluvial Paleohydrology. And this is ties in with what I what Alfred Tyler was talking about from back in what they say 1875. Yeah. The first cargo mission of the space shuttle was flown in 1981. The orbiter Columbia carried, among other scientific experiments, a shuttle imaging radar. The radar system acquired a variety of Earth surface images. But the most spectacular were of the dry Salima sand sheet of the Eastern Sahara, as we're getting into Egypt, like west of, uh, of the Nile. The radar penetrated the sand to reveal sand and alluvium filled valleys. Macaulay, um, in 1982, proposed that these relict valleys and drainage systems were carved at times when this hyper-arid region was subject to extensive erosion by running water, probably during pluvial episodes. So here's what you guys are going to be in a position to appreciate now. If we were to actually sweep away the sand, you know what's under the sand? Channel scab lands buried wow. in sand. Yeah. Thousands of square miles. I knew that it used to, they think that it used to be a savanna, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Parts at one anyway. point. So, yeah. So when we went out to, um, what's the, I can't remember the name of the place, the, the site that they moved. Abu they, Simbel. Abu Simbel. Abu right? Simbel, yeah. Now it's, you're on the lake there. The That's, uh, mm -hmm. the man-made lake caused by the dam that they put up. But the drive out there across the desert, it you just see sticking up out of the sand these these eroded rock yes. forms off in the distance. That, and they yeah, look, now that you say that. Yeah, like, now it makes sense. They look completely different from the surrounding sand. And yes. they're, mm -hmm. they're odd looking because you just got this lake, I mean, or this enormous ocean of sand, and then there's this black rock formation sticking up mm -hmm. out of it like it was just put there. But clearly it's extruding from something deeper. You know, and there's a bunch of that. So it, it was. Yeah. You could imagine that there was a whole. You a whole land landscape type. under that sand. Yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Etched, deeply etched by running water. And they picked this up with radar from the shuttle in the 80s? That yes. Was, wow. Yes. And I find it interesting, the, 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 the reference to a pluvial episode. I'm trying to wrap my head around, okay, what does that mean? A pluvial episode. I mean, well, obviously rainfall, but how much rainfall? Right. Think back is... to what, what, what Tyler was saying. Um, he says these ancient streams, he's talking about, again, here now he's talking about the, the, the wadis, the dry wadis feeding into the Nile channel. There are dry valleys opening into the Great Nile Valley of enormous size so that 300 inches of rain falling in the now dry climate of Egypt would be carried away by the river without much difficulty. That's a lot of rainfall, 300. Um, so now let's uh, go on here. But do you know if, I mean, th does the, you know, there's the standard model of geology have, a, have an estimate on how old these features might be at this point? I have not found anything yet. Okay. And that's, of course, what I'm wondering about. Yeah. Okay. And, and see, here, you know, again, it raises questions. It raises questions. Like, how often do events like this happen? Is yeah. there a frequency? Is there a periodicity to them? I mean, these events that we could call outsized events, events that, for example, what we're talking about here, I mean, whatever there was when this happened, let's suppose there was human habitation. We don't have dates. I don't have dates yet. There's maybe been studies I haven't followed up on that where they perhaps have done some studies on the dating of these, these erosional events that are now buried under the Sahara. 
But let's assume that they happened in the time of humans, which isn't such a huge stretch because we know extraordinary events have happened in the time of humans. You know, the scab lance happened in the time of humans. Think about this. In the time that humans have been around on the planet, the scab lands and the floods in the end of the last ice age and the mass extinction of the mammoths and all the rest happened maybe 10% of the time ago that our ancestors have lived on this planet. Right, recently so, in, in terms of when, how long humans have been here. Yes, yeah. very recently. Yeah. That's the point. So the thing is, you look at an event like the scab lands, you look at the event like we're talking about here. Well, whatever the, the human form, human habitation they've ta taken, what's going to be there in the aftermath? What would be there in the aftermath of a, of a town or a city or village or a hamlet or, or an encampment in the, in the mountains of western Montana or in the scablands of eastern Washington? Well, there isn't going to be anything. What's going to be left? Uh, you know, what are you going to find? I mean, and, and if for a human caught up, let's say, in, in that kind of a current, how long would it be before their entire body was completely demolished? Yeah. Disarticulated, yeah. Completely just, just disarticulated, yes. Ground to nothingness, yeah. Ground to nothingness. That's right. That's exactly right. So they go on in this book, the um, one more quote from it, the background to paleohydrology. In his insightful review of geomorphological processes on planetary surfaces, Sharp in 1980 observed that one of the lessons from the comparative study of landforms on different planets is to think big. Geomorphologists need to recognize that anomalies of large, rare, and or ancient phenomena are worthy of study not for their singularity, but for the large questions that they raise concerning landscape development and the nature of environmental change, to which I would heartily endorse that approach, that, that sentiment there. Yeah, because, Mike, Mike's been telling you, you need to think big, Randall. And see... Well, that I, I'm all along, <laughs> see, he has been Very true. telling me, and I'll, I'll, I'll confirm that he's been telling me all along. So, Mike, I, I concede. I am Thank you, from now on. I will think big. <laughs> okay, you won, Mike. <laughs> I submit. <laughs> Now, look, here I was getting serious, Russ. Sorry. I mean, not Jeez. really, but, you know. <laughs> this was a serious moment. That this was, was a perfect high drama. I mean, you just, like, you just lobbed that one out there. I had to hit a home run on that one. <laughs> you had to. I'm glad you did because I was going <laughs> I to. I saw otherwise. you laughing. I was like, Mike isn't going to say it. I'll do it. Uh, there was a part of me kind of back here that was, you know, doing my best and succeeding and suppressing <laughs> laughter. <laughs> I was winning. My Ross, I mean, no, and then, okay, <laughs> where were we? Um, yes, <laughs> but yes, he is saying he's saying that you can you look at these features, yeah, and you have to, you know, it, it's basically the opposite of the one grain of sand, one drop of water. You have to think exactly in, in like in enormous scales to really be able to actually describe how these landscapes are coming about. Why, how, yeah. how they are turning into what we see today. Yeah, you have to think big. Right. And, and it's not, as he says, they're worthy of study, not for their singularity, because look, oh, this was just some exceptional outlier that, you know, has really no relevance to anything else. That's what he's saying. But when it is, in fact, a, what do you call it? A, a, a lurking variable. You know what a lurking variable is? A lurking variable is, is usually it's outside the range of, you know, statistical uh, normality. Mm. And so it's generally dismissed or ignored. It, it, those outlier variables are yeah. generally ignored in the models. But sometimes there's a lurking variable. If it gets included in the model, completely changes the outcome of the model. Mm. That's your lurking variable. So, um, 
the lurking variable here is the question of whether how repetitive are events of these of this scale. Yeah, is it frequent. a singular event or is it a repetitive event? And if it is a repetitive event, event on what kind of a time scale are we talking about? So, like, when when was the the bedrock of Egypt carved and etched by a fluvial, severe fluvial erosion? I don't know. I mean, could it have been w within the window of some of the other great floods? Or I mean, or was it much earlier? I, I don't know. I would be inclined to think it would have been an earlier event or maybe the culmination of several events. But you have a number of interesting questions raised. Number one, the etching of the, the bedrock, and then the overfilling of everything with all of the sand. What deposited the sand? Is it purely wind deposited or is it water deposited? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And then you've got all those, well, I won't go there. I was just going to bring up the, well, I already started. So the Western Africa, right, it's got uh, south of the Rika, it's got all those current ripples. Like there was a huge mm -hmm. tsunami that washed up over, you know, the northern half of the continent. Yeah. So was that simultaneous? Right. I mean, what is clear is that there have been catastrophes that have happened all over the planet. In fact, I, can we find anywhere? any landscape on the planet that at some time or another has had some kind of a catastrophic force or event helping to shape what we see there now. I, I, I mean, it appears to me that pretty much everywhere, even areas where it's not obvious, because, you know, if you have a mountain and that mountain is eroded down and you have that material going out, well, think about the, 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 the Southern Appalachians, which were, you know, once, the grandeur of the Rocky mountains are greater, right? And they have been worn down. Some of that wearing away produced material that flowed to the east and some to the west. The stuff that flowed to the east formed the Piedmont of the Southern coastal plain. And the stuff that flowed to the west ended up forming the horizontal layers that comprise the Cumberland Plateau, which also has been deeply, deeply incised by eroded, erosive events. And once again, what's if, if we could go back in a time machine and, and be in a UFO and hover over and, and observe what would be creating those landscapes, what would we see? Would we see one big event or would we see a succession of events? I, I, I tend towards the succession of events um, rather than one big singular event that happened one time and it was over. But um, so well, going I found, back to Alfred, I, talk, yeah, go I ahead. I found Russ. this interesting thing just talking about the Sahara. Um, so this is saying that during the Ice Age, I guess it says twenty from twenty two thousand to ten thousand five hundred years ago, the Sahara was devoid of any human occupation outside of the Nile Valley, and it extended two hundred fifty miles further south than it does today. But then between ten thousand five hundred and nine thousand years ago, there were huge monsoons that swept mm -hmm. through the Sahara and transformed the entire region into an ha a habitable area uh, and created some of the wadis, they're saying. The wadi uh, Hawar, which is a, one of the largest tributaries into the Nile from the Sahara, was full of water during this point. And flowing water. Yes, flowing water. Yeah, that, and that's a whole lot of flowing water. Yes. I mean, yes. they're not denying that it was flowing water. So for 500 years, there were enormous monsoons that basically turned the most of the desert into habitable regions and people moved out there and there's, they found rock carvings out in the desert. Uh, they domesticated livestock, had sheep and goats. Now, how did they know that the wadis were formed? Because for one well, thing, if the wadis were already there, any, you know, obviously. Yeah, sorry, it doesn't say formed. It just says that it was full of, it was, had a flowing river in it is what it says. Yes. Sorry. Okay. See, yeah. that was my, my question because obviously even if you have a, a, a relatively no, normal pluvial period, like the kind that, you know, I mean, obviously just like modern rivers occupy the ancient huge channels. Yeah. You know, and so anytime you're going to have water flow, they're naturally going to follow the channel system that's already there. Right. That's my question. Uh, you know, are we saying then that those wadis formed? In that wind, that interval, or were they already there in the, 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 um, you know, uh, um, 
augmented river flow was just occupying the pre-existing wadis. Yeah, the, the exact text says there were large rivers such as the Wadi Hawar, which was once the largest tributary to the Nile from the Sahara. It doesn't uh-huh. say it was formed. It just says there was a big river in it during this period. Yeah. Which but around 7,300 to 5,500 years ago, the monsoons stopped. Yeah. And then it became a, it became a desert again. So I wonder what so that, kind of bore, bore samples have they've done. Anybody who's done. I don't know. It's, pour, it says. Pouring down to bedrock. It says they took, they took a bunch of radiocarbon dates of human and animal remains from more than 150 excavation sites mm-hmm. um, of places where people were living out there. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's, that's what it says. So people, okay, what were the date the people were occupying there? Around 10,500 years ago, okay. sudden bursts of monsoon rains over the vast desert transformed the region. Uh, and then for the next... At least a at least a thousand years, people lived out there yeah. until the monsoon started to retreat, and then they all kind of moved back into the Nile Valley, which is again the only green place. So, so during the Ice Age, the Nile it was it was desert and uninhabitable, and then there was this period, I guess, right at the end of the Younger Dryas, where there were lots of rain during the cli- climatic optimum. Yeah, during the hypsothermal, pretty much precisely. Yeah, <laughs> this is a transitionary period then. Yeah, yes. so you, you, basically the people show up about a, a millennia after the Younger Dryas. Okay. Is what it's sounding like. Yeah. What do you say, 10,700? 10, 10,500 to 9,000 years ago. So yeah, within, so yeah. About 1,000 years goes by, and this is where I would speculate is that, you know, post-Younger Dryas, we've got a, a very a, a, a largely reduced, widely scattered human population. And we don't see a whole lot of cultural activity in that first millennium. We don't see much at all during the, the uh-huh. during the younger Dryas. Uh, there's certainly a diminishment. And, 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 you know, if you read the studies, most of the studies are working under the assumption that, well, there was human occupation here. And then at the beginning of the younger Dryas, these people got up and left and went somewhere else. Right. But then you keep reading the papers and you go at some of these potential somewhere else's, the same thing happened. Well, people got up and left and went somewhere else. Well, maybe people didn't get up and leave. Maybe they succumbed to whatever was happening. And it's not like that cultural group survived and went somewhere else. Just just, they got wiped out, just like, you know, the, 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 Vikings that were colonizing Greenland. What happened to them? Nobody knows. I mean, there's graves there, but really, yeah, nobody what really was knows the them. final yeah. demise of them? Nobody really knows, but they're gone. Yeah. But think you about know? this is this is the pull quote from this article. The climate change, which turned most of the 3.8 million square mile large Sahara into a savanna type environment, happened within a few hundred years only. That's fast. Like three, three, yeah. three almost 4 million square miles were turned from like one of the most arid places on the planet into a savanna environment with lakes and pools and rivers. That must have taken an enormous amount of rain. Yeah. So, but not so much rain. I mean, you can't have too much rain or or it dissolves everything and yeah. washes everything away. Yeah. So, I mean, what Alfred Tyler was talking about when he was looking at those wadis, I mean, three, he says not even 300 inches of rainfall per year. That's a lot of rain. That's a lot of rain. Yeah. I mean, I think Atlanta, where I'm at, it's 40 or 50, so it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. six, seven, eight times as much. We have the same have thing. To look at not even three and see uh, where, where that would be if your pole point changes right over toward Hudson Bay. Oh, yeah. You know, if there we, was a crustal shift, then maybe that We heard the, the same story. The same story was it in Utah, right? Moab, they told us. They were talking about Yeah, I was the thinking monsoons. about that. The monsoon stopped. Because it yeah. used to have, it used to be like forest forests and stuff up there where arches is and all that. Yep. Where it's just red rocks sticking out everywhere, and uh, the monsoon stopped and all that died, and now it's just desert. high desert. Now, now, Aaron. did that happen before or after they outlawed SUVs? <laughs> uh I don't. I I'm pretty sure it was before, they, unless before they outlawed the crystal spaceships. 
And then, oh, that was it. Yeah, and that yeah. stopped the Atlantean climate change. That's what happened. Uh huh. Because you know there is no such thing as well. There was there used to be natural climate change, but that ended. You know that ended about the mid twentieth century. It just stopped. Whatever whatever was driving climate change previous to just say mid twentieth century up because we were taking just, over. It gave up. Yeah. Said yeah. Okay, you guys got it from here on. <laughs> The sun said, okay. The climate we're denied to participate. <laughs> so, one of you guys look up Serana, C Y R A N A, Serana fluvialis. Serana fluvialis. Okay, well, it's undoubtedly got a different name then because I was trying to figure out, see, because I don't remember finding it, but it's what the, the name that Alfred Tyler was using for in back in 1875 okay and it's it's an aquatic animal it's a shelled animal and i'm not sure exactly what kind okay well it doesn't really matter the fact is that they live in the nile river now they're they're creatures that live in the nile river and alfred tyler found them 120 feet above the present water level yeah and uh so then he, he he's inferring from finding those, and, and that wouldn't necessarily be the highest that the, the water rose, um, but 120 feet above the present water level of the Nile, as it was in 1875. Um, now, that would have been before the, the building of the Aswan Dam. So I'm guessing the water level would have been higher. Does that make sense? If you're below the dam, the water level would be higher before the dam. Unless. Well, it fluctuated a lot, right? It did fluctuate yeah. a lot. But right now, the water level right there by the Giza Plateau is about 55 feet it's above controlled, sea level. yeah. And so if you add 125 feet to that, what do you get? About 175 feet? What they say? 55 feet plus 120 is going to be 175 feet, which would completely submerge the air, the spot that the Sphinx is in, but then it would basically get right. The, the base of the great pyramid of Khufu, which is lower than Kefren's pyramid by some, I think 30 feet or 40 feet, something like that. But if you, if you took the 175 foot topographic line above sea level, that comes very close to the Eastern edge of pyramids Khufu. So if the water level rose 120 feet above its present level, it would be the the sphinx would be submerged and the water would be lapping at the eastern wall of the Great Pyramid. But that's at 120 feet. Now I don't know, did the did the water rise much higher than that? Well, that gives us a minimum to work from. So from there, I think that the Sphinx is about 80 feet, 80 to 90 feet, right in there. It varies because you've got the the, the, the Sphinx enclosure, and then it steps up to the plateau surface. And I think that That's offsets right. about 30 feet, if I recall. It's high. It's That plateau is, is high above Cairo when you're up there. Like one of the things that Yusuf yeah. did was when we were standing there and people were asking, you know, was this underwater? He just pointed out to Cairo and said, well, there's the city way down there. So the water would have to come up quite a bit to get up here. Mm-hmm. So Alfred Tyler goes on to look at, you know, he was English, so he goes on to look at Great Britain, and he makes this comment. He says that I think 300 inches of rain is the smallest quantity that could have fallen in a year when the great masses of the Thames Valley gravels were deposited on ground where the present streams cannot move the old deposits. How many times have we seen that? Yeah. And right there, that's one of your indicators that there was a major deluge. But the, so now he's looked at the Nile River and he's looked at the Thames River and he's seen the same kind of an effect and, and concludes that 300, and he's going basically, what's the greatest rainfall known in historical time? I think it's around 300 inches, isn't it, in a day? I think I that's know. where he got that number from. Um, 
So Henry Howorth in 1882 published a paper in the Geological Magazine in 1882. Sir Henry Howorth, who was really one of the great catastrophists of the late 19th century. Um, he says, putting ice aside. Oh, this is from his, his article in the Geological Magazine entitled Traces of a Great Post-Glacial Flood, Evidence of the Loams and Brick Earths. Quote, Putting ice aside, we are bound to conclude that the remarkably irregular, twisted, and folded stratum, which tops the brick earth deposits, and this is in, in Great Britain, and which is the last stage of that deposit, was due to nothing else than a violent flood of water. In fact, we could hardly have a stronger and more convincing proof of our contention that the period of the mammoth was terminated by a great diluvial movement. Now, just think, think about that, a great diluvial movement. And now go back to the Baker, Komutsu, and Klutz quote, planetary scale movement of water. Planetary scale movement of water. And then think back to um, the first quote, which was, Sir James Hall, and he says, according to my view of the subject, the facts brought forward clearly indicate the operation of immense torrents. Now, he's talking about Northern Europe there, right? England. I mean, so what we're seeing here is that the imprint, the overprint, if you want to call it that, of these enormous events, outsized events, events completely unprecedented in our own historic times were recognized early on by some of the very first observational geologists looking at these landscapes. And I think I demonstrated that we have some of the preeminent paleohydrologists of our own time, basically confirming exactly those early interpretations. And that's something we have to now recognize, planetary scale movement of water. And if that is a reality, and I think the evidence is writ large all over the entire planet, well now, and if those things have happened since the time of man on Earth, well, what kind of assumptions can we, can we cavalierly make about prehistory? without taking that into account, without factoring that into our thinking. I don't think we can. I think if we're going to understand our past, we have to really reset the stage. And, you know, in uh, Mike's words, start thinking big. Got to think big. I think we all agree with you, Mike. You finally convinced us all. That's right. To start thinking big. Well, I looked up some rainfall stuff. So Good. The the highest this is the record for rainfall in one month. In one place, month, in, yes, in a place in India received 366 inches in one month. <sighs> that same place received it has another record for that same year, and they have the highest in one year. 1,042 inches of rain they got in one year. Oh my! God. So what? The highest. Okay, what 20, does that look like? Yeah, the highest in 24 hours was out in the Indian Ocean somewhere, and it was 71 inches in a day. Um, Jeez. And then there was a place, I guess, in Maryland received an inch, 1.23 inches in one minute. That's the highest amount of rain ever received in one minute in recorded history. One minute. <laughs> yeah. Man, <laughs> one could point, you even... 1.2 inches in a minute. Yeah. Could you I, even stand up? I think right. that's the level you're talking about where... You know, in the James River flood, 1969, when Hurricane Camille, we've talked about that, stalled over the headwaters of the James River. And mm. just, I mean, I, the peak the peak uh, uh, rainfall there, I, it was something phenomenal. But it was so intense that birds that were sitting in trees drowned. Right. Yeah, that's what this sounds like. And then the, the place that has the highest average annual rainfall is is also in India. And they their average Every year is 467 inches a year. That's their average rainfall. So there's and there's, what what 
catchment basin does that fall I don't in? Know. What we river should, does that? We I should mean, look what? these places up. Yeah, I can't pronounce them. Uh, <laughs> they're in India. But yes, this place, this is amazing. What, do you don't know how to speak Hindi? <laughs> Mas, Mas Yuranyam. Uh, Cherapun- Cherapunji is the place that received 1,000 inches in a year. Cherapunji. I don't know how to say it. Um, but yeah, huh. that's a lot of rain. There's a lot of rain. 366 inches in a month. That's crazy. So who lives there? I mean, and what do they do? I mean, <laughs> right. I mean does anyone live there? <laughs> yeah. that's, I got to know more about this place. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, so, I mean, this is kind of cool. There's a whole article on it. So yeah, Cherapunji is a published? village in the Indian state of. There's a village there. Yeah, some village in the Indian state of Mag- Mag- Magalaya. Okay. Um, and they they're the ones that received 1,041 inches of rainfall in the 12 months between August 1st and July 31st in 1861 and 1860. How? Yeah. That's like, I mean, what is that? Three inches a day? Right. Crazy. Something, I mean, how, how do you have a village there? I mean, <laughs> who is that they're measuring? What are these people doing during this? I mean, how do they, you, you couldn't have a crops. It's, the village I mean, is on a lake. <laughs> oh, man, I gotta, I gotta look into this. Yeah. And then the, so Unionville, a small town in Frederick County of the state of Maryland holds the world record for the highest amount of rainfall ever received over one minute. On July 4th in 1956, after a large storm, which lasted for 50 minutes, dropped 2.84 inches of rain, but they received 1.23 inches of it in one minute. So, yeah, that was a torrent for a while there. That was, uh, yeah. So, was there any floods? I, it only ended up being two inches total. Oh. Right? Two, or almost three inches total in 50 minutes. But I guess when it first started, they got 1.23 inches <laughs> in one minute. So, it must have been coming down like out of buckets. Yeah, I mean, that's almost like not, you, 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 I don't even think you could be thinking in terms of raindrops. <laughs> right. It's I just, mean, you got to be thinking like sheets of water right. coming down, yeah. you know. Well, maybe that gives you, give us a kind of a perspective on, you know, what would happen in a bolide impact into a yeah, but ocean, it's just, it's ocean just, or an ice sheet. It's just crazy yeah, to the, think about this, that there are places on earth right now that are not now this the one this this happened a hundred years ago, I guess, but that place got a thousand inches of rain in a year and three hundred and something in a month. That's in have the you 1800s. ever seen those? I agree with like cloud bursts. I, I don't Sorry, know how Mike, that place like, avoided being washed away. Yeah. Well, there's something called like a haboob. Does that come from India? You see these clouds, and just all of a sudden, there's something that releases, and it just really it's this huge dump. It is like a huge bucket, just lets the bottom drop out. Uh, who moves in dust storm? Okay, that's not a thrown name then, but yeah, I've I've seen videos of them on you know weather stations, whatever they were. But yeah, it's it's crazy looking. It's just something like lets the bottom up. Okay, so yeah, this- Randall, that bolide, like the the idea of an impact, like when I think of that hitting the atmosphere, and the atmosphere being you know an elastic material, mm-hmm. it's like spring, right? It's going to resonate after having that that thing punch in and basically burrow a hole all the way down or explode. This is, you know, like winding up a spring and the reverberation in that atmosphere is going to create all this, these vortexes spinning out from that. And I mean, who knows? I, I, when I run the model in my head, you know, I see these giant hurricane like features just coming off of that thing in every direction, picking up all this water. Yep. And really, yeah, a, a impact like that would have so many cascading consequences right. and feedbacks, both atmospheric and as it hit the ocean itself. Yeah, and, as and you, undoubtedly, I think that the turbulence would be so extreme that it would have it would spin off, you know, um, wa- giant water spouts and cyclonic storms oh, yeah. and and all of that kind of stuff that would be sucking up water, right. just like you said. And what happens, you know, if that happened, you know, and, and you have um, the delivery of that water to, you know, to the land, to the terrestrial area. And it's going to scour it out. It's going to be, yeah. I mean, I think that we, we can now, without stretching, stretching it too much into the realm of science fiction, begin to conceive of ways that you could 
have these extreme pluvial events within the natural order of things. And, you know, a bolide into an ocean not only is going to, you know, inject enormous amounts of water into the atmosphere, it's also going to create tsunamis. So can you imagine, you know, a coastal culture dealing with both the atmospheric consequences and the tsunamis? And if you had, you know, a maritime culture, well, a maritime culture is going to be located on a coastline. And I think you're going to have it coming from from both sides. You're going to have huge amounts of river, I mean, huge amounts of water dumped into the river basins. So now you're going to have these overcharged rivers flowing into the sea, and you're going to have tsunamis. And I'm going to guess tsunamis are probably going to be first to make landfall. And then whatever they don't erase, then that gets mopped up by, you know, the overland flows that are channeling into the pre-existing river valleys. And yeah, so and, on. and really big tsunamis go back and forth and back and forth. And forth. Yeah. So in the aftermath of an event like that, in the terms of human habitation, what's going to remain yeah. as testament to their presence there? Nothing. That's the problem. See, that's the problem that I think that the archaeologists have not fully reckoned with yet. And certainly not in some of the controversies about, you know, ancient cultures and civilizations and what went on in prehistory or what may or may not have gone on in prehistory. I think we should look at, since we're talking about cyclonic storms and stuff, I think what we'll do is we'll pick up the next one. We'll start talking about hurricanes and tornadoes. And we'll look at some of the historic hurricanes and historic tornadoes. And we'll look at some of the records uh, of what's been happening recently. And then we'll ask the question is, you know, if we look at the last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, are we looking at something that's unprecedented in terms of intensity or frequency? For example, if we're talking about hurricanes or we're talking about tornadoes, um, perhaps because of the fact that we also devoted a lot of time to talking about the great firestorms of the 19th and early 20th century. And I think we've got a pretty big concept now of the possibility. I mean, because when we start looking at modern forest fires, some of them have been bad, but they actually are like an order of magnitude less in their intensity than, than the fires we've been talking about, the Peshtigo, the Hinkley, uh, the Manistee, um, the Miramichi, the, 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 big, the big burn of 1910. These fires were in a class by themselves. And I think the question I was trying to raise in all of that was, can we explain that level of firestorm based upon the same kind of a forces that we've seen at work um, in our own time? And the answer is in most cases, I think no, except there have been some exceptions. And, and we concluded our discussion of these great firestorms with the fires of 2015, Santa Rosa, and so on. Um, and we saw some very interesting parallels there. But again, what we see is that even in the case of those fires from, from that summer or from that, from that fall, they still seem to be qualitatively different um, in terms of the ferocity, the intensity, and how completely they can consume everything in their path. And so what I was hoping to imply from that is that people begin to understand that what we're looking at, if we look at, we scale up from what we consider to be a normal. I mean, right now there are people out there fighting forest fires right now all over the place, which is they've normally been doing for a long time. They're not fighting fires, though, on the scale of Peshtigo or Hinkley or the Big Burn of 1910. Okay. We're looking at like an order of magnitude greater. I think one of the implications of that, and, and again, um, in homage to the uh, idea of thinking big, I think we have to think that in terms of those fires, the Hinkley, the Miramichi, the, the uh, uh, Peshtigo, and et cetera, we have to be thinking about maybe another order or even two orders of magnitude bigger. And I think we are now seeing the evidence. We're seeing the evidence that there were tremendous global, global firestorms 
at the lower, younger, driest boundary. Okay? When we add that to the mix, and we haven't even begun to talk about volcanoes yet, and how the responses, the internal terrestrial responses of the planet Earth may may be responses to what's being imposed upon it from outside. This is, I think, going to be a very fruitful line of thinking and research, is that we have to consider the Earth now as part of a much larger system. And seismic activity, volcanic activity, meteorological activity, the even just the ocean currents, all of these things are intertwined and they are very much being influenced by what's happening on the larger cosmic framework. And that sometimes the cosmos impinges predominantly, I would argue, in the form of impacts, but also the accretion of cosmic dust. I would also include the possibility or the pro say probability of the sun, because I think we have only just begun to understand that most, you know, stars in the same category as the sun do tend to be much more variable than we're assuming our own sun to be. That's another topic of conversation. But when you start taking in aggregate, all of these potential catastrophes, the fires, the floods, the droughts, the, the all of it, right? The volcanic eruptions, when we start putting those all together and realizing that these have played a really profoundly important part in the history, not only of the planet, but of the human race. Again, it's, it's a point that I cannot emphasize enough or reiterate too many times. And that is that we have to begin looking at our own history in that context of catastrophism. And it's only in that context that we can begin to really make sense of our own history. And realizing too, that the mythology that's come down to us, the legends, the folklore, these traditions are rich and ripe with insight and knowledge into these processes. And they can augment and complement the scientific inquiry that's looking at microscopic evidence, that's looking at macroscopic evidence, that's looking at human scale evidence. So that's where I think we need to go to. And, and it's in that framework that we, we can only, only within that framework that we can have an intelligent discussion about climate change. Because the, the, polit the, the, the politics of climate change wants to exclude from the discussion this whole realm of natural change that we are talking about here that is now overwhelmingly documented and proven to have been a major part of climate change, environmental change since the planet began and certainly since we've been here and is certainly not somehow now become gone into hibernation and is not, not operational anymore. So I think that's where we'll conclude for this evening. But next, next one we'll pick All up right. and we'll talk about some tornadoes right? Oh, and hurricanes good. and cyclones. Twisters. Twisters and other things, yeah. Because I've lived through a few hurricanes, and that was pretty exciting. Can be exciting. After, right. More exciting after it was over. And you could, right. Reminiscing. It was is a little bit unnerving. <laughs> with the hurricanes? Time. Tornadoes. You Both. told us a couple of tornado stories. Yeah, we got we got some hurricane stories coming too. Good. We got one hurricane story. Uh, uh, Camille, not Camille. Um, Nineteen sixty, uh, late summer. It was early fall when we, we just moved to Louisiana. Uh, was it Carla? Oh, up and okay. Yeah, Louisiana. we got hit with yeah. a hurricane. Right. Anyway, Mike's family's got some hurricane history too. So, oh yeah, yeah, we got stories coming. All Where right, was well, your family from, Mike? Uh, we were military, so all over. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. The, the earliest hurricane I remember was Biloxi, about nineteen fifty-five, somewhere in there. Yeah, I. You see, got was, uh, well, Michael, a couple of years ago, right uh, down in Panama City. Yeah, my created some the family one. havoc down there. Yeah, I tore up the house. My dad had to move out. Uh, yeah. So we can get into some of those. So yeah, yep. come out and see us in the Scablands. Uh, by the time this comes out, we we'll probably still have four or six weeks to get your travel plans in order. Uh, it's um, 
September 19th through the 24th. And then the second one's going to be the 26th through October 1st. And, uh, know that we're going to do it again in, in May, unless, you know, gas prices or, you know, who knows, airline price prices go crazy and people decide they can't travel. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's more coming. It's so awesome out there. And, uh, come out and join us so that's that's a big one we're trying to get people to come to and then obviously as we started with the sacred geometry class uh the workshop in tennessee coming up uh soon yeah and if you can't travel then just uh join up with the live stream that's right and i it's it's going to be the opening salvo we're going it's going to be it i put it this way this is an invitation to enter the temple of sacred geometry and find out about some of the amazing properties and wonders and things that are you're going to find there. It's it's a, it's an amazing study. But All right, you got to wanna... get, you know, gotta Go get the the basics, and that's this first one is about the basics. Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to put out a big thank you to the people that have continued to support through Patreon. Uh, that's been a big help. Uh, part of that's gone into the, some of the new equipment that's gone into Randall's studio right behind him. I don't think he showed his uh, gantry that's holding the new lights and uh, the camera's oh, yeah. going to be operational. Randall will be doing some uh, some of his own version of uh, one-on-one or two-on-one, however it plays out. Uh, guest there right at his uh, octagonal table. And uh, so, so, yeah, thank you that's for awesome. uh, yeah. continuing Beautiful. to... To New support Randall table. and the Cosmographia podcast. And uh, there has been just some recent, uh, the archives of the newsletter. If you haven't signed up for that, Randall writes several summary articles of uh, some interesting scientific papers that are that are recent. And uh, so all those are available if people haven't seen them uh, after they sign up. There's now the archive is available to the Patreon people. So we're, Yeah, we we're, just sent out the first six editions of the newsletter starting in um, January of 2020. And we've sent out the first six. We'll be sending out the second six. And then because there's 18 months now we've been putting out the newsletter. So what I do is I report on interesting things that are happening, new discoveries that are being made in the realm of geology or astronomy or space exploration or um, climate change or you know, global change, I prefer to call it, um, you know, anthropology, archaeology, anything that I think might be that's of interest to me and is probably going to be interesting to the people who are our listeners. Definitely. So all you have to do is just sign up for it and you get it every month. And it'll also, you know, talk about whatever we're up to, upcoming events and things and maybe reporting on recently past events. Just sign up. All right. All right. I do want to say that, uh, you know, Kyle and Russ don't want to toot their own horn. I I know, but the $50 Dynasty record is out Mm -hmm. pre-session. They've done an incredible job. Uh, It's available directly on their website. uh, And you can also become a Patreon supporter. And they are putting out a lot of uh, additional content there uh, because I'm one of those supporters. So uh, great job with the album, guys. And uh, Yeah, it's excellent music. People check it out. And uh, as always, I'll put all these links in the uh, in the description for the videos. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And Mike, I thank you for your contribution tonight. Yeah, Mike. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. A very non-normal contribution from normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Great all show. Right. Thank you very much. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Gentlemen. Yep. Good night, everybody. Good night, y'all.